it always hot in here. Okay. We are covering the the incarnation. We go back. Um, Prior to the Incarnation, <clears throat> before the Incarnation took place, did Jesus have a human nature, John? No. No. What kind of nature did he have? Divine. A divine nature, because he was God, the Son of God from all eternity. The Father eternally begets the Son. That's why he's called the origin of the Trinity. Like we conceive words, concepts in our minds, the Father conceives the word. From all eternity, he knew himself perfectly. The Father had no beginning, neither did the Son, because the Father always knew himself perfectly. It's like an analogy here. I was just reading a book. Actually, it's in Spanish. I'm reading it. It's on the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And he talks about the Trinity in this book. And he used an analogy saying, did the Son ever exist at a time when it was not giving off rays? No. The sun was always giving off rays, right? Light always emitted from the sun. Just like the word always came forth from the Father, from his knowledge of himself. Okay? So the Son is eternal with the Father, although he's a distinct person. And then the Holy Spirit is the love between the Father and the Son that has existed from all eternity. There's no beginning in that either. Okay. So <clears throat> in the fullness of time, as it's called, the Son becomes man. And why did he become man? What reason did the Son have for becoming man? The Son was sent by the Father. Okay? The Father sends the Son to do something. And that's why he became man. What did God the Father send the Son to do, Jack? Die on earth. Die on the cross. Okay. Could he have done that as a pure spirit, the second person of the Trinity? No. God can't die. But when he takes the human nature, uniting it to himself, then he's able to suffer and die. And there's only one person in God. He's not a human person. He's not a human person. He's not a human person. He's a divine person. But he's got two what? Two what? Luke, he has what? Two, two what? Not persons, but he's got two, two, I He's got a divine nature Nature's and uh, nature. two natures, okay? Divine and human. He's always been God. He's had a divine nature. All the attributes of God, all knowing, all loving, eternal, okay? All powerful. And he's got a human nature. What does it mean to have a human nature, Luz? What, what makes up our human nature? What? Oh, our um, intellect and free will. Well, that's the spiritual part of us, oh, but we are, we're not angels. Angels have an angelic nature, pure spirits with intellects and free wills. But they're not eternal. They're created. Okay. We share the, with the angels part of our nature, which is our soul. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's the spiritual part of us. Okay. Our bodies are the other part of us. We're body soul composites, meaning they're put together. Okay. If you separate the soul from the body, you're dead. This coming Friday, the first time I've ever had this, I had a double funeral. I don't know if any of you read the Kenosha paper or heard. Oh, about a week or so ago, uh, there was a fire in one of the apartments over by the, uh, the lake. One of the condos or apartments, I'm not sure. A house. Died, right? A couple, an old couple, an older couple. And the woman died right away, and the husband was, he had burned 75% of his body, and he died a couple days later. And I, you know, it was on Friday for both of them at the same time. And um, yeah, it's very sad. Anyway, when, when our, their soul is separated from their body, <clears throat> when that happens, we're dead. But when our soul is united with our body, we're alive. Um, we have 
more than a vegetative soul, which is what plants have. We have more than uh, a sensitive soul, which is what animals have. They can sense things, okay. Um, you feel pain. We have an intellective soul, which that's because our, we have an intellect and a free will. Now, did Jesus have an intellectual soul? Yes, he did. He had a true human soul. When did he begin his life, his existence with the human soul? At the incarnation. At the enunciation of the incarnation. Actually, when the angel announced to Mary that she would be the mother of God, Mary says, how can this be? I do not know man. Meaning she never intended to have relations with Joseph. And the Holy Spirit assures her, or the angel assures her, you will conceive by the power of the Holy Spirit. When Mary says, let it be done to me as you say, like we say in the prayer of the Angelus. Okay. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me as you say. The word becomes flesh okay. by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Son of God, while remaining God, becomes man in Mary's womb. Now he's both God and man in one person. This is a mystery. And you have to have faith to believe it. Because there are a lot of people who don't believe this. The founders of our country didn't believe this. They were deists. Okay? A lot of them. For example, Thomas Jefferson. You know, he wrote he, he rewrote the Gospels. Did you know that? Thomas Jefferson. Mm -hmm. He rewrote them to he took out all the miracles because he didn't believe Jesus was God. He just thought he was a good guy. He was actually, uh, in that respect, an Arian heretic. Remember who Arius was? Remember, okay? He's the priest that went around in the early 300s teaching there is a time when the Son of God was not. And Jesus was just a good God. Okay? Yes? All right, so you're talking about how when people die, the soul leaves their body? It does. That's what so causes it, death. Yeah. Okay. So does, uh, does that mean that like, the body doesn't really matter anymore? Like, is it, when people talk about like, creating people, is there anything, is, is a Christian that should be wrong with creating people? Well, uh, actually it was it was held as a pagan practice. Yeah. Okay. So that's because, because we have reference for the body, to bury the body, someone's body, is is a, a, a spiritual work of mercy. Yeah. You're, you're burying the body. And why do Christians reverence the body? And this, this deals with, okay, at death the soul separates from the body, but why is the body still important to each one of us? Do you know why? Because Jesus Christ came back. Well, Jesus rose from the dead in the body, and he is the basis for something that's going to happen, we hope, to all of us here glory. together at the end of the world when he comes again in glory to judge the living and the dead. What's going to happen when Jesus comes back <laughs> to judge the living and the dead. Before he judges the living and the dead, something's going to happen. Rapture. To, there's going to be the resurrection of the body. That's what we profess in the creed. We believe in the resurrection of the body. That happens on the last day. When Jesus comes again, the dead are going to rise. Everyone who's died is going to get their bodies back. Either in a glorified state, like Jesus has now. Okay? He's got a glorified body. He rose from the dead in a glorified body. No pain, no suffering. Everyone's going to have a body beautiful, by the way. You wouldn't die it or anything like that. And we think the body's going to be, I mean, the body you die in is not going to be age-wise the body you get back. I mean, some people die in infancy. Some people die at 105. You're not going to live for eternity with a body like a little baby or all shriveled up 110 years old or something. The common thinking is that we're all going to get a body like Jesus, 33 years of age. We'll have bodies beautiful, perfectly proportioned, okay, all of us. And um, anyway, that's when we get our bodies back. Um, Jesus, his resurrection from the dead is, is, is the basis for our belief that we will rise. Again, Jesus tells us this. In fact, there's something else that we need in order to have our bodies rise again. I'll just throw this in. Jesus says this in John's Gospel, chapter 6. 
Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood, which is the Eucharist, I will raise him up on the last day. The Eucharist is the risen, glorified body and blood of Jesus. That's why Jesus says, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood for you to be raised up. So we're not at that. We'll get to that a little later on. Okay? Anyway, we're, we're back to Jesus now. Is that Jesus is the Son of God who became man. He takes a human nature formed by the Holy Spirit. Mary didn't have relations with Joseph, okay? And the beginning of his life is the incarnation. What does incarnation mean literally? And flesh, carne flesh, right? For some question, we see. Carne flesh, see? Yes? Well, it means meat. Meat, yeah. Flesh, meat, meat, yeah. Same thing, yeah. Flesh, meat, okay. Same thing. So, it's the enfleshment of the word. So, Jesus takes a human body and with a human soul, he's got a true human soul, okay, with a human intellect and a human will. But in his divine person, he's only one person, he has a divine intellect and a divine will. And like John, the good theologian he is, he asked me a question last week. Do you remember the question on this point? It was a good question. About like isn't that why, um, was it about why Jesus questioned? Um, yes. Okay. In the garden, remember, the night before he dies, he says, Father, if it's possible, remove this cup from me, this cup of suffering, you can say. But, what does he say? Not my will, but but yours, yours be done. So he's speaking there from his human nature, not his divine nature. Because it would make no sense. His, his will, his divine will, is the same as God the Father's will. They have the same will. So he's speaking in his human nature. Not my will, but yours be done. Why did he say that? Because everyone doesn't want to have to suffer. But he knew that this was his purpose coming here. Okay? God sent, the Father sends the Son to redeem us. That's why he takes the human body and the human soul. Okay? So, Anyway, to understand who Jesus is, because the world does not know who he is. Most of the world doesn't know who he is. They don't. We have a billion Muslims who don't know who Jesus Christ is. They think he was a good guy, a prophet, that Muhammad is the greatest prophet. You have the Hindus, the Buddhists out there. You have a lot of people who don't know who Jesus Christ is. A lot of people who call themselves Christians may not really realize who Jesus Christ is. And we come to know who Jesus Christ is by looking at the heresies in the early church. Because there were false teachings about Jesus right from the beginning. Um, the big one we talked about, the first really, really big one that split the Christian world okay. under the Emperor Constantine was Arius. Okay, that's the back of the sheet. Pick that up so you can look at it. Okay. Nicaea 1. The Emperor Constantine, Pope Sylvester, was the Pope at the time, 314 to 335. He sent his legates. And um, as I say on the left hand side, the, the priest Arius taught that Jesus Christ was not God. The Son of God was, was not God, but was created. He was a creature. And the Council of Nicaea condemned Arianism, which denied the divinity of Christ, defined the consubstantiality of the Father and the Son. Consubstantiality means of the same substance. We are not of the same substance as God the Father, the Son is, in his divine nature. And he took a human nature to that divine nature. And this was the beginning of the creed. It was put together, actually 325 is the Council of Nicaea. 325 AD. So the creed that we say at church every Sunday, that comes all the way back from this time. And it was to clarify for people 
of who Jesus was. He's not a creature. He is God. What do you deny if you deny that Jesus is the Son of God? You deny the Trinity. Okay? You're denying the three, there are three persons in one God. There's just God. That's what the Muslims believe. So, Nicaea is the first ecumenical council. The second big ecumenical council that we're going to deal with, well, the Council of Constantinople, that dealt, dealt with uh, the Holy Spirit, defining that the Holy Spirit was God, because there were people denying that the Holy Spirit was God. That the Spirit was just like a force, like Star Wars, the force, or something. Okay. No, the Holy Spirit is a person. And that was Constantinople. The divinity of the Holy Spirit completes the ninth scene Constantinople in Creed, where we say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Okay? That's from this council. All the way back in the fourth century. See, people have been praying the same creed for, for 16, 17 centuries already. Okay? But in dealing with Jesus, the next big heresy is Ephesus. Okay? Does anyone know where Ephesus is? Ephesus, Ephesus, Ephesus. Have you heard of Ephesus? It's modern-day Asia Minor. It's on the coast of modern-day Turkey, I should say. What we call Asia Minor. Modern-day Turkey is Ephesus. It was a big seacoast town. Does Ephesus sound familiar to anyone? You ever heard Ephesians. that? Ephesians, that's right. Okay. St. Paul was there for years. He, he stayed there probably the longest of any city he visited. And he wrote an epistle, a letter to the Ephesians. And the tradition is, it goes back to the early church, that John the Evangelist, when things were, were the persecution started under, you know, whatever, we started persecuting, persecuting the Christians back in the, after Jesus died, He's, he, was, he was a nutcase. He was an absolute nutcase. He was, I mean, wickedly uh, evil, and he was, he was a little crazy. Okay. Uh, his name was Emperor Theodosius. Not Theodosius, no. I'm, I'm talking about first century. Okay. It was Nero. You know, Nero used to dress up uh, in animal skins and, and like rape little teenage boys and things. I mean, he was, he was a sicko. He was really a sicko. And um, anyway, he, he set Rome on fire, at least that's the story, and he blamed the Christians so he could get rid of them. Well, when the persecution started, John flees, uh, actually before even Nero, you think John, John fled, um, John the Apostle, he, was, he takes off to Ephesus with the Blessed Virgin Mary. Do you know the home of the Blessed Virgin Mary? You can go to Ephesus and visit the home of the Virgin Mary. They uncovered it um, and, and doing excavations. It was actually through a mystic. Her name is Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich. She was given this mystical knowledge and she described to in her in her writings exactly where you could find the Blessed Mother's house. She said, here's where it is. Here are the landmarks around it. If you dig there, you'll find it. And there were archaeologists. They went. They looked for the landmarks. They found them. They dug. They found the house. I have pictures of that, of Mary's house at Ephesus. You can go visit it. Anyway, blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, she lived in the late 1700s. She was a mystic. Um, but anyway, we're going to get back to... Okay. So Mary, Mary lived at Ephesus. We have good historical evidence to, to support that. And, uh, but we fast forward a few centuries, okay? 431, there is a bishop, that's the right-hand side there, see where I wrote on the column, Bishop Nestorius held that Jesus was a human person and a divine person, that Mary conceived and gave birth only to the human person of Jesus. Therefore, Mary was not the mother of God. That's what the story is coming up to you. Mary's the mother of Jesus. She's not the mother of God. Uh, you grasp this, okay? Because Jesus was two persons. 
Mary conceived the human person, Jesus, in her womb at the Annunciation, gave birth to him, and uh, Nestorius, I'm pretty sure he taught that at the baptism of our Lord. Remember when he goes to get baptized, John the Baptist, he goes in the Jordan River, the Holy Spirit comes down, then the divine person, the Son of God, unites with the human person, Jesus. So Jesus is two persons. He's divine and human, but in the sense of being two persons. And therefore, Mary, we can't call Mary the mother of God. Well, um, this flew in the face of the church's belief, you see. Because from, for already over 100 years, the title Mother of God had been used in reference to Mary. It was accepted all throughout. Okay. But there was a specific title. Did I write it here? Um, ah, yes. Well, it's, in, it's in the little, the little paragraph there. Okay. You see where it says, Ephesus 431, the Pope at the time was Celest Celest Celestine. Okay. The emperor was Theodosius II. And see, the emperors would call, would call the oftentimes the, the uh, councils because people were starting art to start, to start arguing and the, the, everyone would be split, they'd be fighting over this. And so this council was called in 431 and condemned Nestorianism, that's the heresy it's called, okay, which denied the unity of the divine and human in Christ. Okay. It defined that Mary is the mother of God. See the word after that? Can you read that for me? What is the word after? Mother of God, Theo. Theotokos. 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 That's a Greek word. Theos in Greek is God. What are we studying in this class? Yeah. Theology. It's the study of God. Theos, logic. The study of God. Theology. Mary is the Theotokos. Mary is the God bearer. That's what Tokos means. That's the phrase that was used at the Council of Ephesus because they were the council was, was held, they were using the Greek language at the time. So they said Mary is the Theotokos. She is the God bearer. She bears God. She's the mother of God. And that term had been in use. That term Theotokos had been in use for, for at least 100 years. They could trace it back. So when Nestorius comes along and says, wait a minute, we can't say that Mary is the Theotokos, that Mary is the mother of God. She's only the mother of Jesus. This throws everyone in, in confusion, you could say. So they held a council. And they defined that Mary is the mother of God. In fact, people were marching through the streets. There was a big celebration after the Council of Ephesus because they proclaimed Mary the Mother of God. And when you're proclaiming Mary the Mother of God, they could do that with the understanding that Mary conceived Jesus, who is the Word made flesh. What Mary the Mother of God doesn't mean, does it mean that God the Son of God began his existence in Mary's womb? No. It means he began his existence with taking a human nature in Mary's womb. But because Jesus is just one person, therefore, we can say that Mary is the mother of God in the sense that God became man. Jesus isn't two persons. He's one person. That's why I stressed you can't say Jesus is a human person. Otherwise, you're a historian heretic. You don't want to be heretics. So we can truly say Mary's the mother of God with the understanding that the Son of God didn't begin his existence in Mary's womb. He always existed, but he began his existence as the word made flesh in Mary's womb. Mary conceived the Son of God who took a human nature in her womb through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why she can be called Theotokos, the mother of God. I'll give you an example of a modern-day heretic. I, was, I, I did studies um, for, in, in Mariology, that's a 
the study of Mary um, in Dayton, Ohio, at the University of Dayton. Uh, they, they have a, uh, an institute based in Rome housed there in the library. The largest collection of books on the Blessed Virgin Mary in the world is located in Dayton, Ohio, in their library. It's called the Marian Library. That's where I did my studies. And they had a college chapel on the, on the campus there. It's a, it's a Catholic college, the University of Dayton. It was founded by the Marianists, who, whose founder is uh, a blessed Joseph, William Joseph Chaminade is his name. Anyway, in the chapel, they had a beautiful high altar, a big altar in the sanctuary. And on top of the altar, above the tabernacle with the Eucharist there, they have a statue of the Virgin Mary. The Virgin Mary is standing over the earth with her head over the serpent. That's from Genesis 3.15. She crushes the head of the serpent out like this. It's Our Lady of Grace. Okay. And I'm in there praying one day in the afternoon. Uh, I think it was a fall day like this. It was, it was uh, about this time in the afternoon. And there was no one in the chapel except me. And one other woman I saw walk in. And I, I start to walk out of the chapel. And you know, I just kind of greeted her, you know, and she and she said to me, Oh, I just love to come in here and look up at the Virgin Mary up there on, on, on top of the altar. I said, I said, Yeah, very beautiful. I said, Yeah, she's the mother of God. And she says, Oh no, she's not the mother of God. And I kind of smiled to myself and I thought, I said, well, who is she then? Well, she's the mother of Jesus. See, what she just said is in the story of heresy. And I said, well, I said, is, so I questioned her. She was not Catholic. She was, she was uh, some form of a Protestant, okay? But I, I, I said, well, is Jesus God? And she, she kind of took a step back and thought for a couple of seconds. She says, well, Yes, Jesus is God. I said, and Mary is the mother of Jesus, right? She said, yes. I said, well, doesn't that make her the mother of God then, if Jesus is God? She thought for a few seconds. She said, I guess, yes, she's the mother of God. I never thought of it. But I don't think she, I don't think she articulated in her mind who Jesus was. See, that's why uh, the church's teaching is important because we have to be able to define terms when we say nature versus person. Jesus has two natures. He's only one person. Mary is the mother of God because she conceived God in her womb. She conceived the word made flesh. She didn't conceive just the human person who was born nine months later and then the divine person united himself. Then Mary wouldn't be the mother of but she conceived only one person. Jesus is not two persons. And that was actually defined more at the Council of Ephesus. Pope Leo the Great condemned monophysitism, which denied Christ's um, human nature and, um, uh, anyway, um, I'm going to speak for a moment on the, the very first heresy. Well, actually, I have a, a handout from for you from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. I was going to put it up on the screen, but I always have trouble putting things up on the screen. And it works for me. So, for some reason, it's a constant sense uh, or source of frustration for me when I can't get the, the screen working. I don't like to be frustrated, so I just make copies. This is right out of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. You know what that is? Here's a copy of it. Right here, okay? Instead of having you open this up and look it up on the page of the Catechism, you know, you can, you can look up, if you plug in Catechism to the Catholic Church, Google it, you press the first link, that's the Vatican website link. You can go right to this, that's where I got this from, okay? So, but it comes from this, right out of here. I made it a little bit bigger, easier to see. So. Um, the first part of the catechism, the whole, the catechism is divided into four sections. Do you know that? Okay. The first part of the catechism is the creed. It's the profession of faith. Okay. 
it goes into an explanation of each of the articles of the creed. And um, the second part of the catechism is the celebration of the Christian mysteries, the sacraments, the third part is the commandments, the fourth part is prayer. So in the first part of this catechism, part one, the first pillar, as we call it, okay, under, under the um, article of the creed, see, it says section three, he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and was born of the Virgin Mary. It talks about how the Son of God became man. Okay. Why did the Word become flesh? Well, with the Nicene Creed, we answer by confessing, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit, became incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. Became incarnate of the Virgin Mary. He was made flesh. 457, the Word became flesh in order to save us by reconciling us with God. That's why the Son of God became man, to reconcile us with God, to win back. What did he win back on the cross for us? That Adam and Eve lost. They lost sanctifying grace, the share in God's life. No human sacrifice could restore us, the human race, to God's friendship. Okay? The Son of God had to do it. Yes? So what about all the people that died between those two points? God. Okay. You mean before Jesus came? Before Jesus came and after Adam and Eve. Okay. okay. Well, God, in his plan, this is right out of Scripture, okay, wills that all men be saved, everyone be saved. Yeah. And God even gave the people in the Old Testament the grace that to, Jesus. to um, well, depending upon their state of knowledge, okay, with, with the people in the, the Old Testament, the chosen people, okay, if they put their faith in what was revealed to them, then um, they would be saved through the grace of Christ, which he would win for them, but which would be applied to them beforehand. It's like Abraham, Moses, okay, those people in the Old Testament, is they were looking forward to the Savior as long as they were doing that. What about all the other people who didn't know? Okay, well, then it was, you could say, an implicit belief in that. God, it's like with uh, the Hindus, the Buddhists today, the Muslims, okay, everyone can be saved if as we say, uh, if they have a baptism by desire. If they don't explicitly know that Jesus is the Savior, okay, God will not condemn them, but God will judge their conscience if they would have known. Would they have believed? Would they be, op would they be open to this message? Okay. And only God knows that. It's what we try to bring the message to, to others. So it's kind of like the people in the Old Testament before Jesus Okay. It's kind of like the, the pagans today, okay. people who just don't know about Christ in that sense. They can be saved, but it's much more difficult, yes. Wait, were they, people in the Old Testament, were they in purgatory or were they in hell? Well, when they, it depends. If they died in a state of unrepentant mortal sin, then they would be separated from God for eternity. But if they died being repentant of their sins, I'm sorry, you know, whatever belief system they had, they tried to live a good life by the natural law written in their hearts, because this is what St. Paul says. Okay? Even the pagans who did not have the, 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 uh, the commandments okay, knew, knew basic right and wrong. Okay? So if you're trying to live a good life, the best you know how with your conscience, okay? um, you're cooperating with God's grace that he gives you, then you can be saved through Christ, whether you realize it's through Christ or not. You're going to realize it if you get to heaven. But the good people that died before Christ, they were in what we call Abraham's bosom, the limbo of the just. So they were waiting to see God. They weren't in purgatory. Okay. Uh, purgatory existed then too. They, they could have been there. But the limbo of the just was people who were leading good lives, holy lives. They were, they were the Old Testament saints, you could call them. Okay. They were waiting for uh, the Savior to come. And that's where Jesus descends. You say he descended into hell, third day rose again from the dead. Well, not hell properly. You can go to hell where, where Satan is because that's someone who's there and never gets out. He went to the place of the dead. That's what hell means in the creed. To show them, to reveal to them, I just suffered and died for you. The gates of heaven are going to be open now. Okay. So, 
Anyway, um, so Jesus came to save us. Okay? Uh, that's why he took a human nature to reconcile us with the Father, to expiate our sins. Okay? That's what 457 says. Okay? Only Jesus could take away the punishment due to our sins, restore us to a state of grace. Okay? Now, for tomorrow, what I want you to do is to read over number 461 on the bottom, okay, where it says the incarnation, the word became flesh, and then uh, continue on through number three. It says true God and true man, and it talks about the heresies. The first heresy denied that Jesus became man, really. That was Gnosticism. Okay? Then it talks about Arius, Nestorianism, okay? Read through it. Because we're going to learn about Jesus. Read the Catechism.